Ooh. Oh! 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 That's the way to do it. Herrera. Di Maria Mappa wants it back, gets it back! Fantastic! That's the luck of the bounce off Gaston Ramirez. Top drive! What a day this is turning out to be for Manchester United! Mason Greenwood! Hits the spot! And he goes towards Maria! What a save down in the hair! Brilliant save! Hello and welcome back to the United Devils podcast. Uh, this week we will be uh, making a combined 11 of all the Manchester United Academy graduates we've ever had. And we'll be looking at the best of the best. Uh, with me today, welcome back, Arian. And of course, we should just always ask um, in these in these times, uh, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. Um, I, I guess I'm kind. Of, I feel like I've kind of gotten used to it now a little bit. So I, I've been able to work around not being able to do much in terms of outdoor stuff. And there was some live sports on this weekend, so it's kind of brought a little bit of normality back for me. So I guess I guess this was a, a decent weekend in comparison to the to beginnings. How about you? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, obviously we had the uh, the message from Boris yesterday that was pretty much just a nothing really uh, a, a nothing <laughs> sentence um kind of you can go to work but don't go to work you can use public transport but don't go to work. i think matt lucas did a, a little parody of it it's brilliant um it's basically just saying things that counter each other and not making any sense at the end and it's just really quite confusing but uh that's pretty much what where we're at <laughs> Um, looking forward to, well, hopefully uh, when uh, the football resumes, but obviously um, Germany has actually postponed it due to the whole um, Dinamo Dresden side getting coronavirus, basically. So, oh, so it's not happening on the weekend? It's not. I don't think so. It's, de it's definitely been pushed back pending um, safety regulations and things like that. But um, right. we will see how it goes. Um and obviously the Premier League is set to resume in a month's time, but again, pending safety regulations and the fact that the infection rate will not have increased, but we don't know again. It's all ifs and buts really at this point. But um, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's how we're living at this point. Um, by all these by all these rumoured rule changes and stuff, they should just finish it with a five-a-side tournament. <laughs> that might make it a lot quicker, actually. <laughs> And entertaining. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, United's five-a-side team would be unstoppable, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah, especially with Pogba and Rashford back and Bruno. Ooh. Yeah, absolutely. I'll see. Although a few, few players might feel a bit um, upset missing out. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but, um, yeah, let's go to our uh, main topic of uh, today, and we'll be making a combined 11 of all the best Manchester United Academy graduates and obviously we've got a host of players to pick from uh, Manchester United obviously having one of the best if not the best academies in the world at the moment and certainly for the last 20-30 years it's been producing talent non-stop um, and I can't remember the stat but there is uh, it's been decades uh, since Manchester United have not featured an academy graduate in the starting 18 of any league or um, senior uh, lineup. So, the, it, the, sorry, what were you going to say? I was going to say that the, the milestone in January was 1,400 games. So it's a little bit over that now. Wow, that's that's incredible. I mean, that, that says just how important the academy has been for Manchester United and obviously we can see that uh, through some of the p current players in Rashford and Pogba and Lingard and McTominay and Greenwood obviously uh, some of the youngsters coming through like, uh, that you've been um, looking at uh, like Mengi 
and uh, Ramzani, Williams, Gomez, Chong, um, and obviously looking back uh, with the class of 92. Um, so let's just start. Um, if we start with a, a formation, would you would you want to do the classic 4-4-2? So my, I was going by default of what we were doing with the combined 11s before, so I kind of did a 4-3-3, but I, I, I could uh, probably adapt to a 4-4-2 if that's what we want to run with. Uh, how about we just sort of see how we get along? We'll just... Yeah, sure. We'll start with a 4-3-3, a three, three, and if we want an extra attacker, we can always uh, <laughs> move one up. But, yeah, um, good. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so we'll start with obviously the goalkeeper and um, who did you have in mind? So I was uh, when I was uh, doing some research and trying to put this team together, I was really worried that I'm going to miss out on somebody obvious. So if I do, please correct me. <laughs> but I think for a goalkeeper, I think the standout is obviously Dean Henderson. Yeah. And I think I think. Um, United aren't really that famous for producing our own goalkeepers as they are bringing them in. So I feel like um, even though players like Ben Foster have a l l larger career, but I just feel like uh, Dean Henderson's overall body of work over the last season and a half has been um, outstanding. And even his earlier loans to League One, he he has always looked like he had potential. And but I don't think anybody ever thought that he would quite reach the levels where there is a debate now whether we should uh, start him over David de Gea. So I think he's definitely trumped everybody's expectations, and he's he's on track to have a fantastic career. And he's pretty much, if not the the best goalkeeper in the Premier League this season, he's, he's in the top three for sure. So I think he would make that for me quite comfortably. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, you mentioned Ben Foster. I mean, Tom Heaton as well, same kind of career, but not definitely not going to have the same um, trajectory as Dean Henderson, who looks like he will be Manchester United's goal, uh, starting goalkeeper, and certainly in the next three years. Um, depends on what happens with De Gea, depends on what happens with Romero and depends what happens with Henderson himself. But um, obviously there have been calls to replace De Gea or sell De Gea and uh, plug Henderson straight into the starting team. And I, what, what's your opinion on the, our whole, our, pos our good goalkeeping conundrum? <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 really difficult for me because like I think the Haya for for most of us, especially the fans, kind kind of similar age to um, to us that have been kind of growing up with the post Fergie era. Uh, David de Gea has definitely got a soft spot in all of our hearts because of what he's been doing, and he was for so many years the only bright spark in our team really because he was single handedly winning United points. So. It's it's very difficult for me to just say that he should be sacked off and Henderson uh, should come in and take his place, even though this season's statistics and even last season's probably would suggest that on merit he deserves it. But I think it would be harsh. And I, I really wonder if, if it would be possible to bring Henderson back and make him the second choice, but the kind of a second choice that plays a lot of games, you know, that, that we would rotate goalkeepers maybe quite... Um, Regularly, even in some lesser league games, he could get some game time and definitely all the cup competitions and see how he does in the first season at the club of United's uh, stature. So I hope they can come to some sort of a solution compromise that doesn't see the Haye just get the boot. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, I also don't think that a lot of teams can take the Haye, the money that the Haye will want right now, especially with most of the top teams seemingly being sorted for in their goals for the time being. So... Mm. It's it's definitely a, a difficult situation to uh, resolve. I'm glad I don't have to make that decision. But I guess, like you said, it's it's a good headache to have to have that that two of uh, keepers of high quality fighting for a spot in between the sticks. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, um, Sergio Romero has done exceptional work for us uh, since he came in, and that that can never be understated. Just his excellent clean sheet ratio and everything he has done and obviously um it would well for me i know that uh i'd probably want to see dean henderson go on loan again probably to sheffield united again just because i mean he does seem to work very well in that team and it wouldn't be a 
direct competitor, no disrespect to Sheffield United, but wouldn't be a direct competitor for um, European competitions, say, if we were to loan him to someone like Chelsea, who do actually want it to sign Henderson permanently. Um, and then by the end of next season, Romero will be 34 and his contract will be expiring and you would probably expect to see him leave on a free uh, and Henderson come in. So, that, I mean, either way, it's a sort of a a win-win-win in that sense because then De Gea is still number one. Henderson plays for United and a lot, like you said, as a, a, con- a, a second-choice goalkeeper that does play. And... Um, uh, Romero then leaves without being forced out in that sense. Yeah, it's, it's uh, again as well with Romero. He also has a soft. I have a soft spot for him, and uh, seeing his uh, press conference from a few months ago in the Europa League game, where he said he's dreamed of playing for United, and that's why he's comfortable where he is, and with the amount of games he's getting, because he's just sacrificing it for a team that he loves. So it kind of he wins away into a fan's heart by by saying things like that. So it would definitely be uh, tough to see him just get kicked out of the club for really doing nothing wrong. He doesn't deserve that. If anything, he probably deserves a contract extension if he wants to just remain a second choice goalkeeper. But yeah, in the situation that we're in, I think the ideal scenario would be for Henderson to go on one more loan with a guarantee that he comes back in the season after and he probably does take that number one shirt. But it's definitely an interesting uh, storyline that we're going to be following closely this summer to see what happens. But I think the worst case that could happen is for us to sell him to another Premier League club. Mm, Absolutely. So, yeah. Can't disagree with that, yeah. And uh, of course, Dean Henderson does get into our uh, lineup as well. Um, and we'll move, we'll move swiftly on to uh, right back. Um, and if I, I'll <laughs> present my one, um, I think it's fair to say Gary Neville's a very strong contender in this eleven. Obviously, um, captain of Manchester United, Manchester United legend, and uh, winning so many trophies from. You know, coming through the academy in 1992, he's done exceptionally well. Uh, is there anyone else you want to raise? Or Yeah, no, I, I can't argue with that one at all. And, and like you just take into consideration everything about Neville, the leadership. He was a one-club man his whole career. Uh, he, he never, I saw an interview with him recently that when he said he never even considered anything, he told his agent to just reject all offers because he wants to stay at United for his whole life. So that's the, that's a rare kind of a player that doesn't come around. And yeah, I, I, I see people and himself saying that he wasn't the greatest of footballers, but you don't need 11 great footballers in the team. Uh, you, you need some players that are like him that make up for those things with um, with with their wisdom and, and experience and leadership. And he was just a fantastic right back. And I feel like sometimes even underrated for, for the roles that he played. He had a great ball in him. He uh, he, he was a willing defender. He, he did the overlap as well at the end of his career. God bless him where his legs were kind of given out. So <laughs> I think it's a, it's, it's a no-brainer, this one. There is no competition. I have I had a as a backup option, but that's more on potential. I think Laird could go on to be somebody that's great in the future. Mm. But obviously right right now he's just an he's just an academy player that's trying to break through. So it's it's a no contest for me. I have to agree with this one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> um yeah and uh then we'll go straight into centre back options then. Uh who have you who have you picked? So I was actually struggling with this one because I forgot about probably one of the better center backs we've had in the in the in the maybe even ever, which was uh, Wes Brown. <laughs> I, mm. I I completely forgot forgot about him for for a long time until I was doing some uh, more research. So I think I will never forget that cross he put in from right back for Ronaldo in the 08 final. That mm. was beautiful, and and people forget how early he broke through as well. He was on I think he was on the bench in Munich as a teenager for that for the uh, Champions League final the treble winning season and he had a really good career at United he was there for for uh, for years and he was very solid and he played all across the back four so I think on merit and on everything that he's done for the club he's a legend he's he's featuring often on MUTV and all the fans love him and I think he uh, he makes it into my team and also alongside him I had a few options and I wasn't sure but I saw that Gerard Piquet qualifies as a United Academy product oh, because he? he came to United. 
Yeah, he he came uh, to United as a youth player, for, so we bought him from Barcelona's academy. And before uh, he ca- came into the first team, he was still a teenager under the age that qualified. Mm. Well, I mean, so yeah, I, so yes, <laughs> yeah. I think it's sort of undeniable that um, Gerard Piquet then, because I, I I wasn't sure whether he would class as a uh, a youth player, but yeah, okay. Um, I can't I can't disagree with either of those. Um, I didn't know about PK, but I thought maybe Johnny Evans would get in uh, may, uh, over Wes Brown, maybe because of just of how good he's been now. But um, honestly, Wes Brown has been sort of just as good a servant to the club as Johnny Evans. Probably better because he he won more. Um, and so, yeah, I can't disagree with either of those. And PK is obviously one of the best centre backs in the world at the moment, even, and he's been that way for a long time. So I can't disagree with either of those at all. Um, yeah, it's, it's such a shame that we never got to see more of PK United that it just didn't work out for him because he could have still been playing now. But look at him, yeah. he's still playing and and being a stellar of that backline. Yeah, absolutely. I think he. Um, I read. Uh, an interview from uh, when he did move back to Barcelona. It was just about uh, Barcelona saying they wanted to come in and um, bring him... He he used the word bring him home and he said, well, he couldn't say no and Sir Alex Ferguson was very understanding about it. Disappointed, obviously. And then PK started against uh, Manchester United in the um, Champions League final, the the season he moved and, you know... uh, they won, uh, Barca won 2 0, obviously, with Messi's infamous header, I believe. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the rest was history. PK won, I think it's 30 odd trophies at Barcelona. It was definitely paid off the move. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, uh, well, uh, what could have been? <laughs> Let's um, move on to uh, the left back. Um, and for me, I had quite a bit of difficulty because I'm not sure. Um, if we did have many uh, options, yeah, but I was, I was in the, I was in the same boat. I couldn't find any left backs that are great, or that went on to have great great careers. So yeah, exactly. So I, I've I've gone for Brandon Williams at left back. Me too. Uh, have you gone for the same? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. He, I mean, just this season he's been. You know, he pushed Luke Shaw to play a lot better, and Luke Shaw did. Uh, but obviously, it's because Brandon Williams played so well, even at the age of 18. Um, he worked well as a left back, as a right back, or even as a left wing back. Um, uh, with a right, uh, naturally right footed player, that is something that's very difficult. Um, something we praise Ashley Young for, too. But obviously, for someone who is more a natural defender, that is kind of. It's more com- it's more comforting to see him there, but um, he's done very well in every time he's sort of come into the team, uh, and you know he made he's made everybody else work harder to keep their places. So he's you know he's definitely one for the future, but he's also one that's um, good now as well. Yeah, I feel like he's the kind of player uh, that can. Tran- transcend managers that he's the kind of a player that every manager will want him in their squad because of what he can bring to the team on either side of the defense and with his uh with his charisma with his passion for the club with how he plays the tackles he can put in and he's also very good technically so yeah i think he's the he's the kind of a player that he could have a very good career at manchester united maybe not necessarily as the first choice all the time but that's also a possibility because what we've seen from him and how he pushed Shaw, like you said, I think he's shown a lot of promise this season that he can definitely build on. And it wouldn't shock me whatsoever if United don't sign anybody for that position in the summer if he ends up reclaiming that spot uh, next season because I'm sure he's going to hang around the, the first-team squad now because he's become a bit of a regular. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. And um, While people would agree that Shaw hasn't been the best, I mean, he's certainly been pushed to play well this season, and I think that's what he needs. He needs to be pushed to do well, because otherwise he'll feel comfortable and not work perhaps as hard as he would. So, 
hopefully this should ignite both their careers because they'll competition can never harm any position really so we'll see how that gets on hopefully um i'm hoping that we won't have to invest in another left back when uh, teams are not going to be willing to sell players just because they won't be able to buy players in return really so hopefully um those two will com- uh, compete with each other and make that their that position their own really we've done our back four it would seem uh and Dean Henderson um, between the posts, Gary Neville on the right, Wes Brand, Gerard Piquet at centre back, and Brandon Williams on the left. So we should move straight to the midfield options. So uh, you've got three midfielders. Um, I'm pretty sure I know who they are, but let's go, let's go for them. I've actually got five. Five <laughs> midfielders. <laughs> I was just browsing, and I saw that United have produced quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, and also, I have a bit of a dilemma with David Beckham. I didn't know if I want to put him in midfield or if I want to put him in the front line. So, uh, so I guess we'll get to that when we when we get to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I, I guess the first name I'm going to throw out is Paul Pogba. Yep, absolutely. Uh, I I don't think we have to say too much. He's on his day the best midfielder in the world, in my opinion. When when he wants to turn up, he he turns up. I was talking to somebody about it a couple of weeks ago, actually. How. It just felt like Kante was kind of beginning his decline a little bit in that World Cup, and Pogba was really the kind of uh, the pivot in that midfield that led them to World Cup glory. I feel like it was very underrated how he adapted to the Champs system and the role he played in that side. So I feel like he doesn't have to prove anything to nobody, and I can only hope that he stays at United, he commits his future, and he he's part of this hopefully great team that is being built at the moment. And then... Um, my second one is McTominay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think that's a, another one that's, I think, in a similar boat to Williams, whereas managers might come and go, but he will stay because of just what he can offer and how versatile he is. And he's actually improved a lot technically on the ball too. So he's not only a big presence in midfield, but he can win the ball back and play a smart ball. He's, he's shown a few crossfield passes here and there too. So I just think he's that kind of a midfielder that I wouldn't be surprised, again, if he started off next season with a maybe improved team after the transfer window as mm-hmm. uh, as that holding midfielder just in front of the back line. So I think he has a big part to play in a, maybe a Darren Fletcher-esque role for, um, mm. for, for United going forward. And then the third one I had a, I had an issue with because I, I, who, who would be your third one before I maybe embarrass myself? Uh, uh, Paul Scholes? Right, yeah. So, <laughs> so Paul Paul Scholes was 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 mine here too. But I was just looking at uh, some other players that United have uh, produced in the past, such as a uh, uh, Drinkwater or Norwood, who's playing well in the Premier League right now. Right. Well, yeah, they obviously don't compare to Paul Scholes. But I was just kind of looking at at the more more recent teams. But yeah, Paul Scholes. I don't I don't know how he slipped my mind. That's crazy. <laughs> it's just yeah, yeah obviously the best the best of the bunch yeah <laughs> um it's i mean paul Sc- i mean yeah obviously i mean he he was you know an amazing player for so long and then he changed his game uh he was was an attacking midfielder then became uh when his legs started to go he became a defensive midfielder and started playing those long passes we know he he can certainly still do, actually. And, um, uh, well, I mean, there's uh, there, there are, I mean, other players. I mean, like Nicky Butt as well, but obviously not, probably not of the same calibre as Skulls or Pogba, maybe um, between him and McTominay, but I'd probably go for McTominay just because McTominay could probably outdo Nicky Butt's ability. But, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Skulls, Pogba and McTominay seems like a very competent midfield and I can't sort of see any kind of who I've got up front other than, I, th- I believe, Rashford. I can't see any any other forward taking priority um, instead of them. So, yeah, let's let's go for the midfield three of, of uh, Pogba, Skulls and McTominay. <laughs> yeah, I, I think also what's... Uh, need to be mentioned, but of course, is how he was able to uh, change his game and adapt when he was getting older from bec- from being like a an advanced playmaker in a way at the beginning and scoring a ton of goals to just switching to sitting in front of the back four and directing the the play. It was it's really rare to see 
and that's how he was able to keep his longevity for so long and retire and come back and look like he didn't skip a beat. Mm, absolutely, yeah. And um, the fact is, is that uh, his goals tally, while, while it may not be as good as some of the Premier League greats, is still exceptional and his assist is his assist rate is also not uh, the best either. But uh, the obvious the, the the obvious famous debate is whether you who's better, Lampard, Gerrard, or Scholes. So you know because we've got <laughs> we've got the time, I might as well ask you this: um, who, how would you rank them? Oh, it's not a debate. <laughs> it's it's uh, to me, it's Scholes, Lampard, Gerrard in that order. I feel like. People always bring up the trophies where Jared doesn't have that many to show for it, and then he he scored some goals in his time, and he was he was very versatile. But he did he never led teams to glory, unlike Lampard and Scholes. So I feel like the debate should be who's better between Lampard and Scholes. I just I feel like Jared just gets that Liverpool hype, and everybody buys into it, and the media loves Liverpool, so they really push push it. But I think. Um, on the overall body of work, Lampard and and uh, Scholes are streets ahead of uh, St- Stephen Gerrard in what they've done in their career and how they they they've been in so many winning teams that were built around them that they were central to. Whereas Gerrard has never been able to lead his team to Premier League glory, for example. And when they won the Champions League in in 05, he wasn't really the central point of that team either. He was a very good player in that team, but I, I'd argue those teams were built more around players like Xabi Alonso and not him. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I can I can see that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, can't can't deny any of that really. Um, obviously, uh, you know, Skulls played for uh, winning two Champions Leagues during his time and countless Premier Leagues, and uh, Lampard won Premier Leagues under some of the with the best Chelsea sides, and he was and both of them were still crucial crucial players and. Lampard, basically the team was built around him uh, under Mourinho and basically from that point onwards. uh, I mean, it was kind of, he just became a goal machine and no one could really stop him because he just ghosted into the box and then managed to get ridiculous goals. And Skulls, obviously, um, as an attacking midfielder, he'd get, you know, tap-ins and headers and all those kind of goals. But he'd score ridiculous ridiculous goals like the one against Barca or Villa just those ones straight from a corner as well scary Mm. and it's it's crazy to me also how England teams in England teams he was always made to play out of position to accommodate the likes of Gerrard and Lampard and Mm. not the other way around yeah it's odd I mean you could have you could have easily played in a midfield three with Lampard, sort of the more attacking one, Gerrard and Skulls holding, that would have worked quite easily, but I guess it wasn't to be. And also then then you've got Carrick as well at that time, who was playing ridiculously good um, for Manchester United, and he would have probably, and he missed out quite a lot because of them. I'd argue Carrick should get in over Gerrard into those teams. Oh, but. no, no. But, uh, not, not, but, well, I mean, he didn't get in because of them. And that's the kind of point. I mean, the Carrick was playing really well, but yeah. he was not. it was still not good enough for Lampard, Gerrard or Skull. Sorry, that, I wasn't trying to put them in the same bracket. But. Oh, no, I was saying that I'd argue that Carrick should have gotten into that team because he would be more suitable than, let's say, a Gerrard or a Lampard or Skull, like them in a three. I think he would have accommodated more for them to to play in front for like a Skulls and Lampard to play in front of him. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. That's that's fair enough, actually. Yeah. Michael Carrick in that oh eight season when we won the Champions League was sensational. Mm. And he was he was maybe not just as good, but like on the same level uh, when we won the title again in twenty thirteen because he was he was basically controlling every single attack we had. Yeah. Uh, yeah, his his passing range and how he was every, every time the game needed to be slowed down, he could do it. If we needed to speed it up, he could do it. He was a very underrated midfielder. Mm, absolutely. I mean, he's in that kind of Sergio Busquets um, uh, level of players that people don't really appreciate because they control the tempo. Or they 
didn't used to appreciate because they control the tempo of a game and they'd they'd win the ball and then start playing balls forward and no one really appreciated that until basically the last couple of years. Yeah. Especially in teams that are as, as dominant as that United side or as the Barca side, you need somebody in there to conduct the tempo mm. to like kind of slow things down sometimes because sometimes you can get too hectic. So sometimes when you're four nil up, you don't need to push for the fifth. You just slow things down, keep a clean sheet and stuff like that. Or when you're drawing, sometimes they decide when to speed things up and try to push for the goal. So yeah, those are really undervalued players in those huge sides sometimes. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so there we have it, our, our um, midfield three. Uh, let's go for the wingers. So then on the right, I think it's sort of undeniable. It's, uh, it's David Beckham, is it not? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, it's, 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 I don't like, yeah, again, it's, it's not even close. I was just trying to get uh, creative with it and try to, uh, to put Greenwood in there somehow. But again, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not possible because it, it's, uh, it's too, uh, he, he's not, he hasn't played enough. And obviously, David Beckham, probably the best player in the world at times when he was playing for United, but he just never got that recognition in the end. But probably the, the best crosser of the ball ever, maybe. Mhm. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 yeah. No two ways. Well, he made he made that he took over that number seven shirt from from Cantona and made it his own, and he didn't, he, he, we couldn't even um, see the difference really. But I, I wish I could him more, uh, like because he when I was growing up, when I was really young and getting into football, that's when he was in his Real Madrid days and slowly beginning to teeter off from his base the best days but yeah from, from from all the clips that I've seen and from some of the games I've seen him play for Madrid when I was younger he's just yeah class all around mm, absolutely I mean again same for me I didn't really watch a lot of him while he was at United or even you know uh, after then really but um, I mean just from watching what I've seen go back basically in the last few years just because um but it's just seeing his crossing ability his set pieces obviously the um the 99 Champions League final his set pieces were crucial uh and exceptional uh nonetheless and then I, I don't know if you watched the uh the legends game against Bayern Munich, but he was the star of the show in that game. He looks like he was in shape to just start playing right now again. <laughs> I do remember a stat that he had actually put more crosses in in that game, more successful crosses in that game than Young had all season. I mean, it wouldn't shock me. <laughs> oh, it's. <laughs> I mean, he was. I mean, fantastic player, undeniably the um, best right winger uh, at, during his time, really. Um, and then on the left wing, I've gone for Ryan Giggs. I've gone for Adnan Yanuza. Just kidding. <laughs> that, was, that was half a second where I thought you were being serious. <laughs> Yeah, no. I I, I, I waited. I, I saw the pause. You were in reacting. I was like, wow, he actually thinks I was serious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Of course, of course, right, Ryan Giggs again. Like, I, it's 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 um uh, it's crazy to think that United probably had the best wings in world football for for so for so many years. Because after Beckham left, Ronaldo came, and we we still had the best wings in in world football. Shortly, a few years later, when Ronaldo kind of became who he was, so. Yeah, it's, it's like you, it, Giggs is the kind of a player similar to, to to the Skulls, to Beckham. You don't have to make arguments for them. Like they go in that team because of what they've achieved, and the the, the, the level at which Giggs played for 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 so many years, and even when he was older, he kind of dropped a little deeper. And the passes that he was picking out from midfield uh, when he wasn't able to maybe beat players as as much anymore because his pace kind of went off a little bit, but his technical ability and a vision, knowledge of the game. He was just a, he was the perfect player for, for so many years. And I saw um, somebody was talking about it, but I can't quite remember who. Um, that Oh, I was watching a podcast with uh, Clayton Blackmore, who used to play for United in the early 90s. And he was saying that um, at the coaching courses, when they play like inter-coach games, Giggs is still looking like he could play first in football right now. He's in that kind of shape and the passes he plays and stuff. Similarly to what you touched on about skulls, like you don't really lose that 
that's always staying with you. And yeah, it's just a, probably the biggest legend in the modern era of United. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the fact is, his the longevity of his career was, I mean, it was insane. I mean, he retired when he was 40 and he still played and still, I think, he, I believe he scored in every single season he played in. Um, and are the last he, one. Yeah, uh, I think he got a penalty. Oh, so maybe he just didn't score in the Premier League this last season. Yeah, I think that might be it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, he he just he played for so long and he played well for so long and gave us a lot of memories. Obviously, uh, that amazing goal against Arsenal in the FA Cup. Uh, his contributions just he's just his contributions throughout. I mean, it's just undeniable. He's a United legend, and he's probably going to be uh, at the moment. He's probably going to be pushing Wales for um, European victory next year. So, well, hopefully to try and improve on their last Euros, which were sensational, really. Um, but uh, yeah, undeniably, Ryan Giggs is the uh, the left winger, um, and then up front uh, is it was it ever in doubt, Marcus Rashford. Yeah, the, the the legend that they're making you you have to feel like at the, at this point, and uh, w- w- with everything that that guy is doing off the pitch and what he was doing on the pitch this season, he's just he's just class, isn't he? All ar- all around, it's uh, he's he's become a fan favorite really from the first kick of the ball against Michelin, but every year it's just kind of grown and grown, and there was always that little section of United fans that would always criticise him every bad step and even in Mourinho's second season I think there was rumours that he might be leaving and there was, he was never going to leave and I think it was obvious that United would take the side of players such as him or Martial or Pogba over a manager because you just don't get rid of those kind of players because his talent is undeniable and he's been playing at a high level for so long already and he hasn't even scratched the surface I don't think of the player that he can become and I think that he is a, a future captain. I think what he has been doing recently has kind of solidified him as a, despite being one of the still the younger players in the side, he's probably one of the biggest leaders. And he's becoming more vocal now too, off the pitch as well. So I think um, once Maguire's reign as captain is over, he is probably going to, to take over uh, the armband for me because he seems like the kind of player that's going to be here for another 10 years and he's going to lead the line. For, for those United sides, whether it's up front or off the wing. And I wouldn't be surprised if he, w- if he was made the vice-captain for next season. Mm, yeah, I can, I can definitely see that happening. Uh, I don't know who the vice-captain is at the moment, actually. Is it, is it um, Juan Mata or is it De Gea? It might be Mata, because I think he's, he's had the captain's arm more than, um, than, than De Gea. But I don't think it's ever been made official since... Um, since Chris Smalling was the vice captain for Mourinho, but I don't think I don't think uh, Ollie ever made that public. Yeah, I, I'm not sure um, who it might be. Actually, I mean, it's it's in, it'll be interesting to see who they've who they've put if they have actually put someone. But um, they haven't actually. No, they haven't. They haven't named the vice captain, which is very interesting. At this point, who was who was who was it when Young became the club captain? Because I'm pretty sure one got one got announced, but I'm not. I, I can't remember who it was. It was Maguire, I think. Oh, he got it straight away. I think he got it straight away. I think it was because Valen- It was Valencia, then Young, and then Valencia left, and then it was. I think it was then De Gea when Pogba got stripped as well. So it was De Gea uh, being vice captain, Young being. Second ca- uh, first captain, obviously, and then Young left, and I think De Gea got it taken off him or something uh, halfway yeah. through this season, and uh, it was given to Maguire, I think. Yeah, I think you might be right. But there's the, the I mean, the fact is that we haven't named a second captain, which says a lot about not only about Maguire's impact, but just the. Uh, kind of lack of leadership in the team at the moment. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they put Bruno in there at some point. Yeah, no, yeah, you're right. It's, it's definitely there for the taking. Like, the, the team in the state that it is right now, at this point of the rebuild, where the kind of spine is becoming a bit more clearer and they're looking to add quality now, I think 
the, the there is a room there, the platform for players to step up and claim that leadership to show mm-hmm. who's going to be in charge of this team when things get tough and who's going to be credited for being the leader when things get things are good. So yeah, definitely Maguire is one. Obviously, De Gea is definitely a leader, even though he got stripped of that captaincy. The likes of Pogba, who are going to come back, he's definitely one of the leaders. But there's definitely places that are up for grabs to become the face, in a way, of United with their leadership. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, all we have to do is just hopefully sit back and watch and wait and see, really. Um, so yeah, we've done our uh, we've done our eleven. Um, Henderson and goal. Neville and Williams at the fullbacks, uh, Wes Brown and Gerard Piquet at centre back, uh, Scholes, McTominay, and Pogba in the midfield, Beckham on the right, Giggs on the left, and Marcus Rashford up front. Um, firstly, we should do honourable mentions. Um, top five players that didn't make it into the team uh, Cameron Borthwick Jackson for becoming a cult hero in that half a season under Van Hal. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. he was. I think he, he would have been in the running if his career didn't go go so downhill, because he, he was very good when he came in in that Van Hal season. Uh, this is similar to how Brandon Williams broke through. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I mean, just, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, it's it's the fact is that the season that Mourinho joined, he just went on a series of loans, and none of them really turned out well for him. So that 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 obviously hampered his career quite quite a lot because he probably could have got into the Mourinho side because he was quite a competent defender, and Shaw was not sort of performing as well as he would have wanted, and he could have probably fought for that position between him, Shaw, and Daley Blint really. Yeah, sure. But uh, I, yeah, I, I, I think another one for me would be uh, Danny Welbeck. Yeah, That's yeah, more, absolutely. More, more seriously now, but I just feel like Rashford has already eclipsed his career at United, so there wasn't really an argument for that striker spot. Another one for me would probably be uh, Nicky Butt, just because he was part of the class of '92. Uh, Nicky Butt and maybe Phil Neville as well, but uh, Phil Neville always getting outshone by Gary Neville. Yeah, uh, Phil Neville um, and maybe Nicky Butt and probably um, Mason Greenwood as well is probably missing out just, which is disappointing. Yeah, he'll be there, I think, eventually. Mm, Absolutely. I'm not sure who he replaces, though, because that front line is stacked, but I, I think we might have to change the formation to accommodate him, but, but he'll make it. He'll, he'll make it one day. Yeah, might just have to. I think. I think he would warrant that. At, uh, maybe in the next few years. Um, but yeah, uh, anyone else you want to mention? I, I, I mean, this is a bit of a reach because he plays in the championship. But I really like the look of Tom Lawrence as a midfielder mm-hmm. uh, for Dar- for Derby. I think he he made his debut under. I think Giggs gave him his debut when Moyle got sacked. But then um, uh, Louis Van Hal came in and he never really took him into consideration and he went off. And he's having a very good career at Derby so far. He's he's become a good attacking midfielder, scoring a lot of goals. And a, a, a little bit of controversy off the pitch kind of out, outshone his, uh, his accomplishments on the pitch. But I think he could become an interesting midfielder. Um, pretty soon and he might follow a similar path to uh, James Madison who just got snapped up by a, by a Premier League team and became uh, one of the better central midfielders in the league so I think I think he might be one to watch uh, for, for his development because he seems like he has all it takes to become a very good player mm. Certainly will be an important player for Wales in, this, in the future as well um, yep. That is, uh, that they are honourable mentions. So uh, let's look at something slightly different. Uh, the eleven that we've made. Um, what would that win in an average season? I, I mean, that's that's a very good eleven. <laughs> mm. uh, like it's hard, especially if if you're taking all of those players in their prime. Mm. It's hard not to see that team win. Like it's hard not to see this team compete for everything, realistically. It, it also like honestly also like yeah with um, 
it might get uh, a little bit um, weakened by the bench because I feel like we've really named the best of the best in this 11 that United have had. But there are certainly a lot of players that could uh, accommodate that bench and make this a very formidable outfit. And like just looking at it, the defense, all of them in their prime are, are solid. Pogba calls McTominay midfield. Is that not the best midfield in the world? Maybe, maybe with the with the with McTominay, maybe the outlier there. But Pogba and Skulls on their day are two of the best midfielders uh, in the in the game. Yeah, and then the, the front the front line with Beckham, Giggs, and Rashford is potent, all in their mm. prime. So it it would be hard to argue with this team not at least competing and being at the very top for for all the prizes. But it, it would be interesting to see this kind of a team play. Mm, absolutely. Especially with um, Beckham's deliveries and Giggs' pace and Pogba's and Skull's ability to control the tempo. Um, you'd have runners uh, coming in left, right and centre with Neville and Williams and PK and Brown could probably hold their own at the, at the back uh, quite nicely. Um, but yeah, that's... that's uh, it's definitely one that could compete for everything. So I can't disagree with that at all. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to discuss? Uh, I, I, mean, I, I don't know. I think, I think in terms of this, we've covered everything. So I, unless you got something, I think we're good. Um, so, yeah, actually, um, two things have been uh, emerging recently. So the first of which is that... Um, Shanghai wants um, 20 million for Oji Nagalo, which is obviously a lot more than we expected to be paying for him. And United might actually struggle to uh, get the deal done with, obviously, the limited funds everyone has. So people will be wanting more for players, potentially. Um, and the fact that uh, actually other teams are looking at Oji Nagalo. So do you, do you reckon we should definitely go for a Galo no matter what or do you think we should look for other options which might be around the sim uh, same price tag yeah I mean as, as much as I've been a fan of him since he's come to United and I really like what he offers and I would like to see him get a permanent deal not obviously not a long-term deal but a one or two year contract just until we can find somebody there long term to fill in that that that, um, that role for the club but I don't think I don't think United are going to go for it if the price tag is twenty million. I think I think Shanghai are really out of out of uh, out of line with that one because he, he's he's thirty plus. He's going to be thirty one, and um, he's been playing in China for the last however many years. And um, when he came to United, he never he hasn't started in any big games. He's been playing mostly Europa League and cup games in a lower opposition. So, I mean, as good as he has looked, he hasn't been asked to play in any high profile games to see what he's like at the highest level so I think as a, as a gap filler for United right now and somebody with experience and a completely different option up front while United focus on different positions absolutely but for a reasonable price tag yeah absolutely thank you um, would you rather sign someone else if that price tag couldn't be met and if so who I mean that's that's difficult because uh, like you don't really know what United's plan is in terms of say pl when players go to Dortmund the likes of Haaland they don't usually stay there that long if they're firing on all cylinders like mm -hmm. Sancho is already looking for uh, might be moving obviously we know that and if Haaland keeps scoring like that then he's not staying there long because his value is going to increase rapidly mm -hmm. so you would like to assume that United will be back in for him when he becomes available again so it's going to be interesting to see kind of what the plan is. But I think somebody like Moussa Dembele from Lyon offers something similar to what um, Igalo offers. He's that a bit more sturdy, a bit more physical, lower uh, centre of gravity, a solid finisher, somebody who can play with their back to goal, I think. And he's quick and he has an eye for goal. So I think he would obviously cost more, but he's also younger, which, which makes sense. Whereas dishing out to 20 million for a 31-year-old who has been playing in the Chinese league for the past couple of seasons doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. It's just a kind of a tactic for, for Shanghai to get rich. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it would seem like uh, other options would be available if, if needs be. So 
there are things to consider for Manchester United, and hopefully they can get that price tag down, but we'll have to see. Um, the uh, second uh, point I was going to make is that um, if uh, the Premier League resumes um, on the 12th of June, uh, the majority of the bottom half Premier League clubs would want relegation acts. So that would mean that uh, the likes of Leeds and West Brom in the Championship would have very little to play for. Um, what What's your take on that? Should Should they scrap relegation? Uh, that, that that just doesn't make sense. If you're scrapping relegation, then that's half the point of what we play for, uh, done with. So, I think if you're scrapping relegation, then you're basically admitting that you just want Liverpool to win the league. That's mm-hmm. that's the only reason for restarting because there's literally there's not that much else to play for. I guess the top three is solidified, so it's only the top four which is still in the running, and that's and that's it. So you're really going to restart the season for for the top four race. Mm-hmm. It, it, it doesn't it doesn't really make sense to me and and I'm not saying this out of the bitterness because Liverpool have obviously deserved to win the league and they they would do it rightly so if the season was restarted but scrapping relegation doesn't make sense because I, I see that the argument for the bottom half teams is that they're going to lose home home field advantage but everybody's going to be, nobody's going to be playing at home so it's not an excuse mm-hmm. and when you're playing at home you're playing without fans anyway so there is no atmosphere so that that kind of, that part of being at home goes out the window. So I think it's a uh, it just ruins the spirit of the game. And and like you said, uh, teams that have been fighting for promotion all season are just going to be there left empty-handed unless they decide to promote the top two and make it a twenty-two team season next season, which isn't looking likely at the moment. So I think that that idea is nonsense, and I hope the Premier League don't go for it, along with all the other rules that are being rumored to be introduced. Yeah, absolutely. Um... That I mean, that makes total sense. I mean, it would seem sort of counterintuitive to finishing the season. They might as well just declare it uh, void then if they don't want relegation to happen. Um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> it would sort of be like the saying, we're going to just give you the European race and, and that'll be the end of it. Uh, then everything else doesn't really matter because Liverpool basically won the, seat, the title. I mean, there's not really any debate on that point. I'm afraid that is all we have time for this week. Uh, Thank you for listening and thank you uh, to Aaron for joining me. Um, Next week, we will be having uh, another mystery guest and we will be uh, discussing uh, the top 10 most expensive transfers this season and ranking their um, season so far out of 10. If you uh, have any topics or any questions you would like for us to discuss, then please comment below on the video or on the Twitter or Facebook posts. And if you enjoyed this, please like this video, subscribe to our channel and follow us on Twitter for all of our content.